Hi, I'm Eric Christian Olson. I'm here on behalf of Harvard Chan Sea Change and the Environmental Media Association, the EMA, as we call it for short, where I serve on the board of directors. And this is part of a series I host called EMA Talks Real Science, where we give our viewers the opportunity to hear directly from scientists on important climate, equity, environmental, and public health issues. Today, oh man, today is a conversation we all need to be having as we're stuck on our Zoom calls and our kids are on Zoom school and we're stuck inside during a pandemic. This is a conversation with Dr. Peter James on nature and mental health. Dr. Peter James is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Institute, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. James focuses on how spatial factors, including exposure to nature, the built environment, the food environment, air pollution, light pollution, noise, and socioeconomic factors impact health behaviors and chronic disease. Uh, our friend Sky, who helps run this program for Harvard, just referred to you off camera as a brilliant scientist. Um, and that's an interesting entry point into this, which is that you could have chosen anything to study. Why did you choose this specific concentration? So th thanks first for having me. I, I think I've studied for a while how neighborhoods and, and the places in which we live, work and play influence our health. And I think uh, for me, one of the things that, that's, that's been important to me and I think important to many people is, is spending time in nature. Um, and and as, as we you know, kind of develop our, our research on this topic, we've, we've consistently seen that spending time in nature uh, is associated with all sorts of uh, positive health outcomes. And so it's been one of the more consistent findings, I think, in my research, uh, where we've looked at lots of different exposures um, and and I think I think something about green spaces, blue spaces, uh, nature is uh, something I'm passionate about. But also is 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 something that I think us as human beings, um, I think it's 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 uh, core to us. Uh, the the Harvard biologist E. O. Wilson coined this term biophilia, right? This idea that we've evolved with nature to have an affinity for nature. Um, and I think what what I'm doing in my work is kind of building on that. And trying to to test it, what what is the actual evidence that we can see that our connection to nature is actually linked to positive health outcomes, mental health, but also chronic disease risk? So um, I think it's for me something I'm you know personally passionate about, but also something that that really uh, empirically keeps coming up in in my work, um, and we 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 are you know working every day to figure out these the, the processes through which nature affects health, and I'm excited to talk more about that. Oh, I mean, that's, that's, my dad gave me the book, um, The Last Child in the Woods, mm -hmm. about nature deficit disorder, and it came out, yeah. it's got to be 10 years ago now, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so, um, maybe more. And I think it was partially justification and rationalization for the fact that he raised us like wild animals in the yeah. woods. <laughs> like, we yeah. were in the Cascade Mountains, like, hiking and, and traveling on our own, like, you know, yeah. stuff that, as a parent now, I, I would be like, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. Like, I don't know yeah. if like, if I will get arrested if I let my kid go on a hike by himself at, at seven yeah. years old. <laughs> but let's, let's, so let's, let's unpack this and let's go macro yeah. first, which is just, you know, an overview of how access to nature impacts our mental health. Yeah. So, so as I said, there's this, this, this idea of biophilia, but it's, it's been built on with other theories. So there's um, the stress reduction theory, this idea that just being, in nature helps us to kind of cope with stress, reduce our stress levels. Uh, there's also this idea of attention restoration theory. So, you know, we're staring at screens all day long. There's something uh, about that focused attention looking at a computer screen that really taxes our cognition uh, and something about being in nature, you know, watching the, the, the sunlight filter through the, the leaves um, helps us to kind of have that distracted uh, kind of restoration. So we can just sit there you know, uh, and and something about it allows us to to kind of restore our attention, restore our cognition, and we come back refreshed. You're probably familiar with this, this idea of you know going for a walk, uh, and and something about it, you, you feel better afterwards, right? You feel like okay, now I can dig back into things. I have a clear mind, right? And so I think those are the the dominant theories. But um, there's you know a little bit more into the the technical mechanisms is that you know being in green space may buffer our exposure to air pollution. Uh, noise, extreme temperatures, um, and so those those harmful 
exposures, we may be at lower risk of exposure to those things when we're in green spaces, right? Or when we're living in cities with more vegetation. Um, obviously, green spaces could be a, a location, a setting for physical activity. That's a pretty straightforward mechanism, and that's strongly linked to uh, improve mental health. Um, and then, you know, th there's also the, the idea that being in greener spaces, having street trees or parks uh, encourages us to engage with our neighbors and be more socially active. And that has other strong links to, to mental health and, and chronic disease. Um, and then ultimately, the, you know, this idea of, of attention restoration, stress recovery, there may be just the benefit of looking at green space, right? Um, and there are many randomized trials that have shown uh, that, that looking, it could even, even be looking at a computer screen with a picture of nature, there seems to be a benefit. Um, but, but looking at, at, out a window or looking at, um, you know, a, a plant in your home, uh, it does seem to be associated with, you know, lower stress biomarkers, so actual objective measures of, of cortisol, um, lowering your blood pressure, improving your mood, decreasing anxiety, and better cognitive function. So the, these trials are, you know, that kind of the gold standard of, of, of evidence where we have people go for walks in nature and then have people walk in, you know, urban settings, and we can test them before and after both scenarios. Um, and we, we, we do seem to see that there are, there are these improved health metrics after just a short, short-term exposure. Um, and then building on that, we have kind of longer-term studies. And this is what I'll talk more about today. I, I do work on long-term prospective cohorts. So we look at, uh, you know, I, the nurses' health study is one of the longest running prospective cohort studies. 121,000 women signed up in 1976. They fill out questionnaires every two years. Um, and we have all sorts of information on their health outcomes. Uh, so mental health, but also kind of clinical health outcomes from medical records. Uh, we've been following them to, to the present time. Um, and we can link exposure data, basic spatial data on green space to their residential addresses. Um, and so we've, we've shown that, for instance, people living in greener areas have uh, lower mortality rates, right? Uh, we, we've shown that, that depression, the incidence of depression. So uh, starting with people who are not depressed at baseline, if you live in a greener space, over time, you are less likely to become uh, you know, clinically depressed. So we, we have shown in, in our larger uh, long-term follow-up studies that these uh, you know, short-term randomized trials, they, they do kind of reflect what we'd expect to see in longer-term uh, prospective studies, so. That's incredible and also terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I was, I was, I went down the rabbit hole on you. And how many people right now? Uh, the percentage of the world lives in urban areas. Yeah, I think it's. I, I forget what the number is, sixty percent or something like that. But, but, but I will, I will. I just want to put in a plug for for how I think it's not terrifying. I do think that urban spaces can be greened in a way that makes them amenable to to being happy and and living a, a fulfilled life, right? So I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, but, but access to nature doesn't have to mean Yosemite, right? It doesn't have to mean in the Cascades, right? It could, mean, it could mean a tree outside near home or a small park. Um, you know, it, it, we're not exactly sure what the mechanisms are, what the specific factors are, but I think there's a lot of evidence that, that, that it's not about access to a national park. It's about access to vegetation within an urban setting. And that's where we actually might see even the biggest, uh, you know, bang for our buck, biggest return on that exposure. Oh, and, and that plays off to, to what you just said, which is that, you know, it, it, sometimes it can be a person looking at a tree on a screen. Yeah. Like I don't even understand, that has to be some form of mindfulness because it can't actively be, you're not exposed to, to any of the physiological aspects yeah. of. So, so that's part of part of the, the thinking is and I didn't I didn't speak about this mechanism. Some, some people think there's just like these these chemicals that are in trees and that inhaling those are, are what are beneficial to us. I don't think there's that much evidence for that. That might be true, but I think the real benefit we get is there's something about uh, and, and it's maybe subjective, but you know maybe it's something about the beauty of nature. Um, but but there is something that we have evolved to have. Uh, an affinity for this, right? We like looking at green spaces, right? The most expensive real estate is probably, you know, the corner office looking at Central Park, right? Uh, we, right. we want windows. We don't want to be in a, you know, in a basement, um, you know, working. We, we want to have views, right? Like th we want to have views of nature. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that I am uh, inhaling the air from those trees. It's, it's something right. that we like. So it, it, it is, um, 
it is a little tricky. And this is, you know, part of what makes what I study interesting, but complex is that right. we don't know, we don't know what it is, you know, like I'm looking at uh, pictures of trees behind you that are cutouts, right? Are, is that sufficient? Uh, does that make me happy? I mean, I think, I think we like that stuff, right? But what right. is, what is the mechanism? We don't really know that. Um, and, and it could be something as abstract as beauty, um, or it could be something, as I was saying, you know, very precise, like we, we need to breathe in some sort of, uh, compound or we need access to, you know, setting for physical activity. We don't know. And so we're trying to tease that out in our work right now. You talked about the fact that people are doing walks and one was an urban walk and one was an urban walk with greenery, but the difference from a chemical standpoint in your body. You, you differentiated those two, am I, am I right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think you know, it's not necessarily about chemicals, right? I, I want us to kind of move a little bit away from, from that idea. Good. Take us take us wherever you need. Yeah, because it's not necessarily chemicals, right? I mean, it could be, uh, there's something about being in an urban setting that's chaotic, that's stressful. Um, you know, it could be the noise. It could be, it could be having to worry about traffic and getting hit by a car. Um, there's a lot of factors that are that are related to again that kind of focus. You have to be focused. You have you're stressed uh, because of different factors. And in a greener setting, in a setting with you know trees and water, maybe you don't have that um, that kind of low level stress, low level attention that you have to um, you know administer at all times. So I think that that could be it. It, it could not. It, it could be you know very very the absence of stress. Effect. Exactly. But that it would show itself stress through stress. cortisol levels, right? I mean, that would be dopamine and oxytocin yeah. versus cortisol, like what yeah. from what's happening inside yeah. your body. That's why it's such like, there's such, that's why I'm so excited to talk to you because, you know, when you talk to a yoga instructor, you talk to a, a mindfulness or meditation instructor, so much of this is theoretical, but you're yeah. using data and science to back up these theories. Yes. And I think, what we're looking at, I mean, the biomarkers, this is a, a longer discussion that, that probably doesn't belong in this. this uh -oh. uh, <laughs> I've already this, derailed us. But no, but the, the, oh, you no. Know, cortisol, cortisol as a stress biomarker is, is, I think, oversold in a lot of ways. And it's, it's okay. a difficult metric to, to use. But when we ask people, when we actually, you know, get self-reported data from people, like that's important too, right? How are you actually perceiving things? Um, and then, you know, how does this manifest itself in, in, in terms of chronic exposure and chronic disease? So chronic, you know, a clinical uh, manifestation of, of depression or anxiety, right? These are important things. I mean, um, you know, I, 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 there's a great study from um, Denmark that looked at actual data on where everyone, you know, they have this, these crazy administrative data sets where they, have, they can see every single person. Um, and they, they looked at where somebody grew up and then they looked 40 years forward and they showed that people who were, who were uh, you know, born in green spaces in 40 years, like were much less likely to have every single, you know, negative psychological outcome under the sun. It was, it was unreal. So like they psychological. have every, psychological outcome, right? So they, they can follow because they have medical records, right? So they have medical records on every person. They have the, the, the residential address for every resident. Uh, of the entire country, and they can show that that living in a greener space was associated with much much lower incidence of all these clinical, you know, psychological outcomes. So not not this is like stronger, I think, than a biomarker, a, a short term yeah. biomarker of stress, right? Yeah. I think I think this is saying like living living long term in these types of communities has an effect on our health, right? Uh, and I think that 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 speaks to kind of what what, what we're doing. Um, in terms of identifying potential points for intervention, right? So we're not saying, and that intervention is not move to the woods, right? That, that's, that's not-, not It's not a Henry David Thoreau? <laughs> exactly, yeah. not everyone can, can do that. Um, but, but I think the idea is to green urban areas. Um, and, and you know, we, we have seen in our research and in other studies that actually people living in, in cities, so cities, Within people living in cities, the greener parts of the city seem to be much more strongly linked with positive health outcomes than, than looking in rural areas and saying greener rural areas. We're not actually seeing much going on. If you already live in the woods, getting a, like, another tree isn't gonna benefit you, right? But if you, if you are in an urban area, we actually see the strongest effects there. So green cities are kind of the optimal 
setting for health. And, and I think we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of correlated spatial factors. I think walkable green cities seem to really be the place where we're, we're seeing uh, the best health outcomes. Can you give an example of one of those with the best version of that a green walkable city is? I mean, I think, I think that maybe I shouldn't say green walkable cities, but green walkable locations within cities. There's lots of cities okay. that have, you know, that, that have set in places that are, that, are, that are greener and still dense, right? So we're not talking about low, low population density. Uh, we kind of want places where we can walk um, to get, you know, our, our, our groceries, walk to a neighbor's house, uh, encouraging physical activity, but also that that are green and have a, you know a nice um, you know, mix of kind of the the walkable, vibrant, and and green and restoring. Uh, I think that's what you know. If I had to put it into you know, plain English, that 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 is kind of the, the optimal setting for for um, you know for health. So when you're talking about that, pay attention to to the greatest potential to improvement for mental health. Can you walk us through, like, you know, I'll give downtown Los Angeles an example, because I lived in downtown Los Angeles, yeah. where there's no green anywhere. Yeah. We had like one park, it was roped off for like yeah. two years. So they're talking about putting in a bike path next to the LA River that's all concrete. Mm -hmm. Is that an example of that? Like, what, what, is, what would be, if you're in, implementing, like, here is a park plan for downtown Los Angeles that has yeah. no green, Here's what I'd like to see implemented. What would that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think I think softening some of the landscape. We have to talk about context-specific interventions, right? So, so Arizona or LA would have very different interventions right. than Boston um, or you know some Miami. So, but I I do think having access to um, you know uh, bike paths and and sidewalks that that is strongly linked with increased physical activity, right? So so having access to um, active transport and, and being able to get from place to place with, you know, on your own two feet or on a bike, um, expending calories rather than sitting in a car is, is extremely beneficial for health. And having green space where possible, or even, you know, you mentioned the LA River, although it's, it's probably mostly concrete most of the year, um, but, but if there is blue space, there's, there's, a, there's a growing body of evidence on, on looking at water features and just viewing water and how that might be beneficial for health as well. So, I mean, I think that that sounds like a, a, a good intervention to me to, to increase both your, you know, physical activity potential, but also your, your views of, of blue space. Do you want to talk about the role that noise pollution and air pollution play in that and how that can be mitigated? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think one of the things that we do in my work, and we've talked mostly about, you know, green space, uh, uh -huh. but, but because of socioeconomic factors, because of historical factors, uh, because of, of racism, you know, th there's high correlations between different kind of environmental factors. So whether that's green space and noise and air pollution, you know, if you live, uh, you know, usually in a lower income neighborhood, um, you, you really get multiple hits, right? You're, you're not just getting low access to green space, you're getting higher, you know, maybe you're closer to the highway, so you have more noise, more air pollution, um, you might have more light pollution too, which we've shown is linked to circadian disruption and, and potentially cancer. So, you know, you're really, you're really kind of exacerbating all of these, um, these potential negative exposures because they're occurring together, right? I mean, that's a really interesting thing because I looked into, and I think you talked about it in 1930 when they started redlining neighborhoods. Yeah. And now present day, the, the percentage exactly. of, of those neighborhoods that have no uh, green access is horrifying. And that's obviously yeah. implemented by our systemic racism. It, it, exactly. So, I mean, we're working on redlining data right now, um, but, you know, a colleague of mine, Joan Casey, just published a, a piece on, on green space access and, and redlining. And it, it's fascinating uh, the way they designed that study. They're basically saying just the effect of a grade difference. So like going from an A to a B um, is associated with lower green space today for, you know, a decision that was purely based on a, a racist housing policy in the 1930s we're still seeing that um, the effects today, and so you know that that is to me uh, a, a substantial issue to, to get. How do you how do you change that? Um, the, these policies have been you know, the, you know affecting generations, and so I think the, the one bright spot that I will say is that as, as I was saying earlier, the 
urban settings, we do see a bigger bang for your buck in terms of adding green space. It does seem to be associated with better health outcomes, but also for lower socioeconomic status and, and you know um, minority communities, the, those populations do seem to get a bigger benefit from added green space as well. So um, there's this term equigenesis, which is a, a, a wordy way of saying that basically uh, green space might help to kind of equalize health disparities. Um, there's wow. some folks in the UK who've done a lot of work on this, but, but this is a, a really, really strong driver of, of thinking about green space and implementing green space interventions in lower income neighborhoods to try and um, you know, provide that benefit to bring health outcomes closer. I mean, it's not gonna be enough alone, but it's at least a, a promising idea. If those populations get a bigger bang for the buck, for, then we should be planting trees and implementing these interventions in lower income areas, more so than wealthy areas, where they're probably already getting these interventions uh, from you know, their own investment or, or, or from you know, policies. Um, and then just to, you know, just to shoot myself in the foot, there's, this, there's the downside of that too, which is green gentrification. The idea that you green a lower income neighborhood and all of a sudden real estate values go up. People think, oh, this is a desirable place to live and you're displacing the, the people who, who live in that neighborhood. So right. we kind of have to keep the, the balance in mind and um, you know, work with communities to give them what they want, right? Um, as opposed to you know, this patriarchal idea of, of, of swooping in and, and saying, this is what's good for you. Um, it, it's, it's more complicated than that, but I do think there's a lot of potential um, for, for these communities to, 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 to get a, a big health benefit from these interventions that have, as we've seen over, over decades, have been reserved primarily for you know, white wealthy communities. Right. This is a question that I wish I would have asked for every one of these that we did, but I'm going to start it now. I'm going to start it with you because I think that you just touched on it which is that if you're crafting policy, right, we're, we're no longer in the dark age of, yeah. of, of, uh, of uh, national level uh, policy. If you were crafting policy for something like this, what would be the first two things you would do on, on a national level? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, it's a big there, question. There, yeah. There's it's going to so require you to, because <laughs> it is incredibly complex, and what you just said was a fraction of the complexity of it. Yeah. But if you're yeah, if you're I mean, implementing tomorrow, and you're brought on a team and said like, what do we do, like on a yeah. national level, what do we do? I mean, you know, as a scientist, I'm I am required to say all the caveats of you know what we don't know, right? We don't know yeah, exactly. I love it. Uh, what 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 specific interventions are necessary. Uh, we don't know whether parks versus trees versus grass, you know, we don't know exactly what to do. But I would say, and there, there's a lot of people working on this idea of, of uh, you know, parks within 10 minute walking distance of every American. I think that would be really important. And I think that in many ways would be a, a way of addressing disparities because many wealthy communities, there, there are parks everywhere, or there's green space everywhere. So I think that would probably focus on, on lower income communities um, on historically uh, disadvantaged communities to try and improve um, the green space infrastructure with the idea of working with those communities. I think that would be the second part is that, that this intervention, this idea of, of greening America or, or, or increasing parks and green space in America, it can't happen from a um, you know, top-down approach purely. It really is a, a matter of working with the community. Uh, we talked about context, right? So, so right. what works in LA might be very different than what works in, in Detroit. Um, so, so you really, you know, should work with community members, stakeholders, see what they actually want, um, see what, you know, what, what actually a, a neighborhood needs and, and implement that. And that makes it a lot harder to, to do these interventions. Um, but, but realistically, I think, I think the, the big thing I would do is, is make sure that all of these neighborhoods have access to green space. Um, I think, uh, you know, especially during COVID, um, there's, there's just uh, such a need for, for having green space and a place to, to get away, um, to be physically active or to just go for a walk and, and get away from your family. If you're in a you know, two bedroom, one bedroom apartment and you have you know, two kids, I mean, it, it's, it's um, really, really just devastatingly difficult to, to, to go through a year of trying to either work from home or um, you know, without, with, without having access to that, that restoring property of nature. Um, so I think this is this has always been an issue of inequality, um, but I think it's exacerbated much like every other thing 
during this this pandemic, where where certainly if you are lower income um, and and even you know minority race uh, neighborhoods have such low access to green space, this is something we we need to address. And I think I think the 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 big thing, if I was going to say the policy thing, also is money. I mean that that's really what 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 drives everything. So yeah. talking about this is great, um, but but you have to invest, right? If we and that's part of what, why I do this work is to to put a uh, you know, to quantify how how time in nature is associated with health outcomes. Um, perhaps we can walk that forward and say it, we know the value of a human life. We know the value of of mental health. We know the value of of hospitalization due to X, Y, and Z. Um, if we can see that this is a return on investment, right? That we know that actually planting trees planting grass, creating spaces that people can be, you know, outdoors and be uh, active and, um, and socially uh, interacting. If we know that's giving us a return on investment, then maybe cities will really recognize that parks aren't just a, you know, a pleasant um, amenity, they are a need. Um, and, and green space is a necessity, right? We need this as human beings to survive. Um, so, you know, we, we do have to invest in these things and we can't just talk about them and, and um, have it be fringe. Uh, I wouldn't say that what I do is fringe science, but I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's not on the cover of the New England Journal of Medicine, right? right. Um, right. But, but this is the type of stuff, this, this is preventative. Uh, this is uh, yeah. actually not only preventative, but it, it's a treatment too. Um, yeah. And many hospitals are, are, you know, creating these, I think, victory gardens and, and different gardens to, to enable people to, to heal. Um, this is not this is not something trivial. So um, I think you know if if again I think equity and having equal access to to green space is important and investing um, you know making a budget for this uh, and and I'm not talking about national parks. We're talking about green space and every ten um, and the walking distance in in ten minutes. A exactly. green space for every American within ten minutes walking. Yes, and I think that's you know what's so interesting about how much of so much of, of how we dictate policy in this country is based on reactive versus preventative or proactive. And I think if there is a way to take this data and present it saying, you know, it's gonna pay for itself over the next 50 years just based on healthcare costs of chronic mm -hmm. disease that we're, we're seeing because of the lack of access to, to what we're looking at. Um, and, it, and it's such a different thing now to have this conversation with the possibility that, you know, there's, you, you could do that. I mean, you could present that and say like here, here and, and there's so much evidence. I went, I went down the rabbit hole when I saw that you went to Sweden to do, um, uh, you, you spent time in Sweden uh, doing, was it in, uh, green buildings, yeah? Mostly green building stuff, yeah. And I'm 81% Norwegian and, and we've always talked about this idea of, of forest schools and, and everything that they're implementing to give mm -hmm. kids the opportunity to do everything you're talking about. And it's always, yeah. that's the saddening part here is that we're talking about trying to get green space every, you know, walkable every 10 miles and, and some of these countries are so far ahead. I've yeah. derailed this. Um, no, I do no, think no. that, no, I fully have, I fully have, but I just, I, it, it's, 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 um, You've talked about it in a macro level. I think you've talked about it from a, from a national policy and, and state. Do you want to talk about it from an individual standpoint? And specifically when we talk about COVID, the adverse effects of not having this during this pandemic versus the positive effects or what's necessary for us as a human. I know my wife, sometimes she looks at me and she's like, you need to go swim in the ocean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and she's fully right at that point. Yeah. Like it's a, it's, a, it's a real deal. Do you want to talk about from an individual standpoint and, and not only mental health, but from... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier is, is right. that, you know, nowadays, it, it, this working from home, uh, if you were privileged enough to do that, right, right. Uh, is, is, you know, we're, we're focusing on social distancing, but we're, we're really socially isolated much more so than we've ever been. Um, and I think urban green spaces are kind of a fundamental resource that, that allows us to be physically and socially active, right? You can be outside uh, because there's natural ventilation and, you know, six feet away from somebody, uh, you can be socially engaged at a much lower risk of any, any um, infection. So I think um, I think that's really important. I, I think as a, you know, 
I know this is maybe dodging your question, but I, I think it's much more important that, rather than at an individual level, I think it's important as, you know, my advice would be get outside as much as you can. Be outside, uh, if you know, weather permitting or close, you know, just there's, I think it's actually a, a, a Dutch saying is like, it's no such thing as bad weather, just the wrong just clothes bad. or bad clothes. Yep. So, yep. I mean, the, the idea is, you know, you, you basically get outside as much as possible. I think that's, that's probably your, your best intervention to, to maintain your mental health and physical health throughout a, a pandemic. And, and you can be socially active outdoors, um, but the big thing is you have to have a place to do that, right? right. Um, right. And so, so in the absence of that, I mean, this doesn't happen overnight, but I mean, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were closing parks because we didn't want people to, to congregate. And I think that was a bad idea. I really think that was a bad idea. I think, you know, we are responsible enough and I think the risk is so low of exposure and, and, and infection outdoors that we should have encouraged that, right? And, and again, money. We should have given the, the management uh, of parks a, a priority and said, yeah. we're going to increase the budget. We're going to you know, take out the trash more often. We're going to clean these parks up so that people can be in them all the time because that's what we need. Uh, we need to be outside. We don't, you know, to beat this pandemic, it's not a question of, you know, burrowing into our, our houses and, and just waiting it out. I think we need to figure out a way to do this responsibly. Um, and I think we're getting better. I think, I think you know, many, many cities have, have um, created, you know, safe streets and basically closed off streets to cars so that people could be outdoors and, and be physically active and hang out, out in parks and, and in, in um, not only green spaces, but on, you know, just basically walking down the street without worrying about a car hitting you. Um, and I think, you know, something that I, I always think is kind of cool is that this is, this is not new. This is this is what parks were created for, um, and you know Frederick Law Olmsted, who was you know famous landscape architect who designed Boston's Emerald Necklace in Central Park, and he talked about the two great natural agents of disinfection: sunshine and fall foliage. Right, this idea that parks were created, <laughs> parks were actually created because uh, of like dealing with infectious disease outbreaks. Right, yeah. so that yeah. people could, cool. could be outside. Um, and, you know, basically they didn't know at the time, but, you know, ventilation helps, like yep. getting fresh air helps. Um, and I think there's other benefits of, like looking at trees may help too, uh, to just be happy and, 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 and to have lower, uh, you know, chronic disease risk. And so uh, I think this is, we, we've got to, we've got to, this is not knowledge that we should throw away. We have to build on this and we have to kind of take that momentum. And I think all of us may realize that you know, when we go outside, when we've been stuck in on a Zoom call for uh, you know six to seven hours a day, that something about going outside you you appreciate it so much more uh, yep. than you did before, right? So uh, I hope that it's I hope this is something that kind of sticks with us after this pandemic is over, where we recognize the value of of the outdoors and our green spaces um, and invest in it. And and you know I'll I'll put in one last plug for my research that we've actually sh looked at green space and COVID uh, incidents and mortality. And it's a preprint right now, so it's not accepted yet. yet. But we've shown that, that actually people who had, who lived in counties with higher levels of green space had lower incidence of COVID and, and some places lower mortality rates due to COVID. So it, it does seem like parks help, um, help us to, to kind of, uh, not maybe maybe it's not about being physically active. I'm not sure what the me me mechanism is, uh, but but there are you know greener spaces are linked to lower COVID in incidents. So um, you know I think I think there there's something to be said about parks as you know if if you didn't have access to a park, you're you're still you know, you're a human being. So you're going to find a way to engage with other humans, and and that's probably going to be indoors if you don't have access to this amenity. Right. Well, and we also know the role that vitamin D is now playing in, in COVID. We, we know that sunlight kills COVID within 15 minutes. You know, that's not happening in a pool hall in the basement. Yeah. Of a, you know, yeah. All those things are, are, are happening in, in, in green space. Do you want to talk? It was a, a question they threw in there, but I don't know anything about it. Is wearing these these uh, wearable devices and yeah. how that plays a role in, in your research. I don't even That was such a bizarre question. I don't even know how to ask it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just talk, and you can you can uh, right. see what, what you think. But <laughs> save me but yeah. for myself. So, so you know what I've talked about earlier is like residential address data and green oh, yes. space, uh, and we've talked about questionnaires, like people filling out surveys or medical records, right? But there's so much more that we don't know. We know that people, you know, go outside and move around, so they're not exposed to what's right outside their home all the time. 
So what we're doing is we're actually using smartphone apps and like Fitbits um, to really understand in real time kind of where people are using the, the location services on your phone um, and your activity levels, your heart rate. Uh, we can even look at how kind of your exposure during the day may be related to your sleep that night. Um, so what we're trying to, to dig into is really understand the kind of uh, real you know, personal exposure to green space and how that's linked to physical activity uh, and sleep and heart rate. Um, so the, the idea there is that we, we don't just look at your residential address and say, here's your, here's your green space exit. We can actually say, here's where you went today. Here's, here's where you were physically active. And we can show that people get higher levels of physical activity in greener spaces. Um, and not to mention, we layer on all these other factors on air pollution, you know, walkability, noise, and we can look at kind of how those things interact and see where people are, you know, uh, um, getting getting the, the, the most physical activity or where, you know, what, what kind of exposures are related to uh, better sleep. Um, and, and I will say on the, on the mental health side, we have a, 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 an approach, well, we didn't, we didn't coin this term, but many other people use this. It's called ecological momentary assessment, which means basically pushing ecological momentary assessment, EMA, which is, you know, similar to, <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> yeah, but, but the idea here is that we can push a prompt to you on your phone. So you can answer it in real time. So we can ask about your mood and each one of those responses is geotagged exactly where you are in that response time. And so wow. we, we, we can say, you know, this person, we, we, you know, we prompted them a few times a day or maybe other, every few days, we ask you, you know, how you feel. And, and we can say something about where you were when you responded and maybe in greener spaces, you're happier. Um, maybe in greener spaces, you're less anxious. We, we don't know, well, we're, we're doing this work right now. Um, but the idea there is we have all this GPS data and we'll have your kind of day-to-day -day responses. We can look at, you know, within a person. So within Eric, you know, you are happier in this type of space than another type of space. And so we can create those kind of um, measures and really get at like, you know, maybe personalized medicine, like for you, what, where you are happiest, where you get most physical activity um, and, you know, where your heart rate decreases and you're feeling good. Uh, we might be able to kind of quantify that uh, at a much finer grain than we've ever been able to do before uh, because of all this technology that exists. That's really exciting. I can tell you right now, you can text me. I'll be doing, I'll be in the ocean and my heart rate will be 41. <laughs> yeah. I'll be super, go. super happy. Yeah. You'll be like, yes, this is, this is it for me. And then you'll see me after six hours of Zoom calls and my heart yeah. rate will be 72. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, be, exactly. I'll be cross eyed. I'll be yeah. like, I don't even know my last name. It's all yeah, yeah. just a. Um, that's, that's really interesting. What an exciting time to do the merge. It's what we talked about before, which is like that landscape artist can talk about something theoretical and then hippies can carry it for a hundred years. And then you're taking the combination of that and using the data and the science to back it up, which is why real science is, you know, these are such fun conversations because yeah. it's so much of, of what our intuition I think already knows mm -hmm. and then, and then having the science to back it up and really make change, not only from a, uh, a national level, but also from an individual standpoint. And we know how necessary it is. If you just, if you think about your own life and what it feels like to watch, you know, four hours of television or four hours of Zoom versus taking a walk in, in nature and having that moment, um, you know, fully immersed in it. Um, the difference in how you feel and it's remarkable and to have the science to back it up I think is really exciting. Yeah, for sure. um, do you want to talk at all about um, social, psychological, spiritual implications, any of the, um, I mean is, is, is nature deficit disorder, do you think that's a real thing or is that just kind of a buzz term that, that no one uses anymore? I mean I think, I think it's a, a it's a term that maybe I wouldn't I wouldn't use, but but I think okay. it's I think it's, it certainly plays out in, in everything we've been talking about, right? So so we think about um, you know settings where, especially for you know lower income neighborhoods, yes. where there's there's lower access to green space. I think that there is there is uh, substantial evidence that that there's negative mental health outcomes linked linked to that um, that lack of of, of um, access to nature. So, you know, I, I, I guess what the only thing I would say is that, that the, the, the solution to that is not necessarily a program where you take 
people from urban settings and, and take them to the woods for a day. Um, I think the solution is that we have to recognize the value of nature and integrate it into our cities and into our everyday life. Yes. Um, it is, it's, it, it, I mean, I think it's consistent with this idea of nature deficit disorder, um, but, but, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I think it's really just a matter of, of us recognizing this, this fundamental role that nature plays for us. Um, and, and, I, and I think bringing it back into the, the norm um, where it is, a, it is a requirement, not an amenity or some sort of you know, bonus that you get um, if you're rich. Um, that yep. basically you get to have a, a beautifully landscaped yard or you get to have you know, a, a park that's maintained and is amazing. Um, you know, we, we kind of need to realize that if we are you know, setting out to be an equitable society, um, as you know, the Swedes and the, the you know, regions do. I mean, everyone needs this, right? This is yep. not, this is not just a perk. So um, that's where you know, I think I think we, we really have to focus and, and move towards. And you know, I, I I'm I'm speaking about green space, but this is this is a you know everything multifactorial, right? It's green space. It's you know access to safe drinking water. It's access to lower levels of air pollution. It's access to to Education, everything that, that exactly that that allows us to to uh, have the same opportunities to live a fulfilled, happy, and healthy life. I think that's really um, what we're getting at here. And and green space and nature is one major component there that should be part of the conversation. Well said. Not just a perk, an absolute necessity. And you're right; yeah. it should be a part of that larger conversation about everything that you just mentioned. Um, and that's why we're here. And that's why, obviously why you, that, that's the answer to your first question, by the way, is why did you come to study this? Because that needs to be part of this larger conversation yeah. about equity, right? Yeah. About the, this isn't just healthcare and education. This is also the ability to walk out your door and find green space within a 10 minute walk. Mm -hmm. What does the role of climate change uh, play in all this? Like when you look into the future, five, 10, 15, 25 years, knowing where we're headed, you know, what, what does the conversation look like? Yeah. So, I mean, in my field, we're, we're kind of thinking about this idea of planetary health now, right? So it's, it's about the health of human beings, but also the health of natural systems and how they're intertwined, right? Um, so I think, I think when we're talking about green space and health, uh, we're, we're really talking about planetary health. We're talking about um, you know, planting trees and stormwater runoff management, or climate mitigation, ca carbon sequestration, um, but also you know smaller scale things like urban heat island effects. So, so there, you know, when you have green space, uh, when there, you know, there's this idea of, of urban heat island. When you have a you know, just paved surface, it'll it'll trap that heat and hold on to the heat longer. Um, and so, when there when there are temperature fluctuations. Uh, cities will be hotter than the surrounding areas, um, and and adding green space helps to kind of mitigate the effects of that urban heat island. Um, going back to what we talked about with redlining, studies have shown that that redlined areas are hotter than their you know non-redlined counterparts. And similarly, I think with the green space literature now, we're seeing that 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 those redlined areas have lower access to green space. That's not a coincidence, right? It, it's that these areas had lower lower green space and therefore they have more of an urban heat island effect. So again, this kind of global idea of an intervention where we increase um, access to green space or increase uh, vegetation in given, given areas will hopefully decrease that disparity in temperatures so that lower income areas don't bear the brunt of climate change. Um, I think, I think you know, this again cuts across equity, climate change, health, uh, there's, there's, they're all intertwined. And so I think green space is, is it's certainly not gonna fix everything, uh, but it's an important a, a part of the conversation when we talk about climate change, when we talk about planetary health, it has co-benefits for both human health and the health of natural systems and hopefully increases health equity. Look at that. Oh, do you wanna do one other thing, which is just when, when people are listening and we always talk about, you know, um, from an individual standpoint, from, mm -hmm. from, the, from the viewer, what would be your um, what's your instinct for like on a regular basis? Does a person like if you're if you're if you're a yoga teacher, you're saying you got to do yoga 
four times a week, if you're doing, yeah. you know, if yeah. you're, if you're, you know, what, what is it for you for nature? What, what's, how do we implement that into our regular lives yeah. and how often do we need to do it? That was taking yeah. a long way to get to that question. No, no. Yeah. So, so that's what we were talking about, like dose, right? So what's yes. the dose of nature? What is the dose? Need, right. Tell me what the dose and, is. And everyone wants to know this. I, I will, you know, if, if we have 10 minutes, I'll talk about a little bit more about this. We don't know. We don't know what the dose is. And we also don't know what the specific pill is, right? So we don't know whether it's go sit in a park or, you know, go stare at a tree, um, you know, go stare at a house plant. We don't know that. And that's what we're trying to, to get at with our work. Um, there's some folks in the UK who've done some really cool surveys asking people about the amount of time they spend in nature. And I think they find something that like, I think it's like, it's, it's something small, like two hours a week um, in, in, in aggregate in nature seems to kind of be where you get the biggest bang. And then anything in addition to that is really not, not that much more of a benefit. Um, but you know, that, that's like extremely achievable, right? That's really not yeah, a lot of time. Two hours a week, anyone <laughs> yeah. can do that. Yeah. So, so I think, I think that, that is, you know, a guess at what we, what we think is, is necessary. Um, but we, we don't know. So that, that's, you know, more work is needed, but I would say, you know, start with two hours a week, uh, give it a go, you know, just, you know, walking for you know, 20 minutes a day or something like that. And, and, and that you'll probably get there and you'll probably feel better for it. I mean, give it a try. You know, you, you, we talked about the quantified self with your, your, you know, your, your, your wristwatch, uh, yeah. just check, check and see how you're doing. Check on your heart rate, try this intervention on yourself and, and see how it changes. See how you know you can look at the week before and the week after whether your your resting heart rate goes down. Um, this is this is something that I think lots of folks who who think about you know mindfulness um, think about you know take a walk for a little bit, clear your mind, um, you know take a second and see where your body is. Um, you know doing that and 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 going out into nature, I, I really think there's there's very little downside. And so that's it. Your dose is two hours a week. You can do it six days, 20 minutes, those six days. <laughs> yeah. And and essentially the doctor, you're feeling good. At that point, you are you could have been born in a green space. Because <laughs> Can you win it back? Can you be born in that's, an urban space and win it back? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's that's another thing we look at. With, we think about like time windows of susceptibility. Yep. We don't know that either because these studies have only been going on for, you know, maybe a decade or two. Um, so we need longer term studies. We need to kind of keep following people. Um, but, you know, I work with birth cohorts where we're looking at, you know, does it matter where, where you were at birth or three years or six years? Um, you know, time will tell. Time will tell. But I, I do think that my intuition tells me that you can win this back, right? I think you can, uh, you know, you, you, you're, you're not destined for, you know, uh, depression if you were born in a, in a, a gray space, right? There, I think there are certainly benefits. And I think interventions are going to bear this out where, you know, for instance, Louisville, they're doing a, a green heart project where they're planting trees in a neighborhood in Louisville, and they're going to measure people before and after. I think those types of interventions are really helpful. I, um, Gina South in, in uh, Philadelphia did an intervention where they greened vacant lots, and they showed that people's feelings of hopelessness like decreased over the series of, of months. So uh, I don't think we're talking about, um, you know, foregone conclusions of where you're born, you, you are, you know, you're, 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 there's no ability to change your, your outcome. There certainly is, uh, you know, it's not too late. So I would say, you know, start, start today if you can. Um, and also us as a society have to start, right? This isn't, this isn't only an individual decision. This is us as a society valuing this and, you know, talk to your policymakers uh, and, and get this done because I think it's really, helpful for us uh, as a as a community um, to have these amenities. Let's do it. I'm in. Let's cool. Start making phone calls. We'll just start cold calling right. people. I got Pelosi <laughs> on the cell phone right now. There we go. Good, good. good. Step rolling. I also love that your instincts are just driven by optimism. Like I really appreciate that because sometimes these conversations I think can be difficult to digest and unpack. And I think that at every turn you've turned it into hope and love. And that's a that's a great driving force when talking about the future. So I appreciate you and I appreciate taking the time to, to talk with us.